The following video touches on severe mental health issues, conspiracy, and adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Do you ever feel like something's off? When the hair on your arms stand up? When you feel the non-existent bugs crawling around underneath the skin in your arms? They whisper as they move through the vessels in your arm, trading secrets with one another. You know they're there, though nobody else can see them. You can't stand not knowing what they're saying. On a day of true liberation, these bugs will spread conspiracy within your body no more. Like an orange, you peel back the flesh with nothing more than your nails. The pain, the relief of knowing. Feeling good as you learn more and more of the bug's secret with every tear of your tissue. Finally, you can evict these parasites from your body. This final, manic breakdown leads to a psychosis, now believing that you are more powerful, more understanding than any being on this planet. As you walk the life-filled streets with a grin on your face and a leaking arm, walking tall, able to uncover secrets of subjects that have been studied for eons a trance-like state that allows you to see creatures in an in-between world. The dead tell you their knowledge. You now own this knowledge that spans generations, time, life. You are the ruler. You are the savior. You are God. A full psychotic breakdown. Thankfully to most, these are alien emotions. What they are, though, are exactly what the protagonist of Psychopomp feels. What is Psychopomp, you ask? Before we dive into that, allow me to introduce myself. Hello everybody, my name is Backpack Comics, and welcome to Internet Lore. The show where we look at a subject, game, or piece of internet history, and find out all about it. Today, we will be looking at a brand new indie game called Psychopomp. What is Psychopomp? What makes the game worth playing? Is our main character having a psychotic breakdown? Or are they actually God? Well, let's find out. Psychopomp was released January 30th, 2024, made by Fading Club. The studio is ran by Carbonic, who seems to be the only man on the team. This solo dev has made about three games, all of them looking pretty interesting. Psychopomp is classified under adventure, but I think horror would fit well along the tags even psychological thriller. Dungeon Crawler works too though, as most of the game we will be exploring underground tunnels. More on that later. Other games by the creator include Dream Wild, as well as Dashboard and Nashboard. The two 3D games they've published seem to have an almost dream LSD emulator vibe to them. Psychopomp though, feels more like a bad trip in all the right ways. A lot of research for this initial portion was made actually pretty easy because of his website. He does have a fan art section on his website that is super cool. Much like the Backpacks postcard board, aka my wall for fan art people have submitted to me, it is now my goal to make some art and get it on his wall. <laughs> Moving on, uh, why is this game named Psychopomp? What does it mean? The definition of Psychopomp is spirit guides, to put simply. Beings existing in the liminal. The area in which we cannot see with the naked eye, though they guide our souls nonetheless. Coming from the Greek and Latin roots psyche, meaning soul or spirit, and pompos, meaning guide or conductor. To make the concept a little bit easier to understand, think Greek or Egyptian gods like Ra or Hermes. Now that we have an understanding of the studio and some other face value information, let's talk about the game. Unlike most of my other deep dives, we will not be doing a let's play of the game since the game is a little long. If you do want to see me play the game in its entirety, uncut, bam, the link is right here if you want to check that out. Without further ado, let's just dive right on into the game. I can only describe what I played as a thought-provoking LSD fever dream of a paranoid, almost psychotic woman. Also, another quick interjection here. Remember that these are my opinions and how I interpret the game. If you cannot handle hearing the opinions of others, then please do click off the video. Another note here is if you do end up watching the stream of the full game, there are some things that I missed that I did cover in the second playthrough of the game, which I will be sharing here. 
We open to our unnamed character pondering a conspiracy theory of her own that everyone has secret and psychic powers that they are hiding from her specifically. Seemingly reaching the limit, she has had enough. Our unnamed protagonist builds a helmet that is able to read minds, uncovering these secrets by reading everyone's thoughts. Also for context, the character doesn't have a canon name, so I'm going to call her Pompey just so we know who we're talking about. She named the helmet Machine That Lets Me Read People's Thoughts When I Want To, or Psychopomp for short. What a, what a perfect acronym. Sadly, the helmet works not as intended. The helmet shows Pompey that underneath government buildings there are elaborate and intricate labyrinths that hold many secrets. The helmet also allows you to see creatures from another world. The secrets that all held away from you for so long are now tangible. The answers to everything are within your grasp. You just have to take it. We are introduced to the tutorial level, which is just that. One detail of importance is the dog. A simple dog, but with a strange slit dividing its head. The dog, if spoken to six times, opens its slit. Oh, shit. Um, the dog reveals to us what's inside its slit. Bruh. Nope, nope, not that either. The dog will open up and give us some lore, alluding to our future that the plan will pave itself out for us. We must hurry to find the truth. We are now thrown into the world. Choose your favorite government building, sewage treatment, children's hospital, or public school. Wow, so many options. For the sake of the deep dive, we will be going in order. Starting with the sewage treatment plant, we dive into the building and take the elevator down to a lower floor. This elevator transition is so sick. I feel like this is the perfect way to tell the audience so much about the character. From the laxed dress style to the crackhead eyes and the helmet on Pompey's head, she's fucking nuts. But we love it. Remember the interdimensional creatures we can see thanks to the helmet? Yeah. Well, those creatures are quite strange. Every level has their own set of interdimensional, strange kind of creatures that haunt these labyrinths. In this one, there are kawaii plants that you can talk to and they act very strange. There are also enemies that are more distorted than the non-hostile creatures. Use your hammer to break the hostile creatures into chunks of meat. The chunks bounce around like tender chicken nuggets. Ooh. I'm hungry. On this level, there are also creatures called the Thrape. They are in some of the transient locations as well as scattered amongst the levels. In their entirety, they are a misplaced people. We will get deeper into them as we go along. We find these little nugget creatures. This, this is going to sound so foreign to everyone who hasn't seen the game or doesn't know anything about the game. Yes, these anime fleshticles are called nuggets. They follow the queen. You can find the key to one of the important rooms that you need to progress in this level next to a nugget that is so happy. If anything were to happen to its key, gifted to them by the queen, I might add, that they will explode. After navigating the labyrinth and finding that locked door again and entering, you find the queen. The queen is huge and needs to be recycled. So, you must execute the queen with the guillotine above her. You can cross a bridge and pull the lever, crunk, and boom! The queen is game over now, my friend. Upon doing this, you are gifted an egg of the earth. And thus, ends your first mission. World 2, the children's hospital. I believe this level to be the largest out of all of them. Starting off in the base building until very smoothly transitioning downwards. The children's hospital uses low priority patients to keep high priority patients alive. Yes, you heard me right. Information given to us by one of the nurses we meet. We are then met with Alexander the Great, Cleopatra, and Plato. Our goal in this world is to turn off the life support of these historical figures. The nurses' designs are really cool. I also like how it's insinuated they all just like love their jobs only to be smashed by Pompey's hammer of truth. Some of the nurses do need to be dealt with because they do hold important key cards. When exploring the underground of the already underground hospital, there is an area that is so beautiful with a moon that is like maybe bleeding, I think. It's just a very stunning area. After unplugging all of the historical figures, we are given another egg of the earth. Now, moving on to the final world, we go back to school. Underneath is a giant talking head with no eyes and no teeth that only wishes to feel the sweet release of death as painfully as possible. 
Good thing he is surrounded by a hydraulic press. Those videos are super satisfying. I like when they put things in the hydraulic press that could just like explode. I don't know why I find that like very satisfying. Like balls or toys. Here's an example. Why not? Just in the middle of the deep dive. <laughs> Who are we to say no to the giant talking head, you know? The person breaking and entering with a helmet on that sees, you know, beans between the gaps of the fabric of our world. How could we say no? The design of the robot creatures are very unnerving. Actually, everything about this area is unnerving. This is under a public school. All of these are unnerving. I'm not trying to downplay the fucking, the child, the children's hospital using their essence to keep people alive. I'm just saying like all of this is like freaky, okay? There was a segment also in this level about putting parasitic enamel into children's teeth to help them learn alongside kids. Crazy, man crazy obviously the workers who love their jobs don't want you to deactivate the machine so you do what any you know sane person would do and you obliterate them with your hammer deactivating the control panel we also find out that defiant children are ground up and uh, turned into egg slicers egg we finally get to see the head suffer and turn into putty and meat chunks acquiring the final egg of the world we are given a new location entirely it is just labeled as an entrance with an eye icon. Under every town, there is a Mariana Trench, says Pompey. Looks like she was right. We are at the very bottom of the trench, where anyone else would be crushed similar to a can. The air being forced out of your lungs and replaced with water. As you quickly smash downwards, you become mist and your bones scatter around. If you are lucky during the very fast process in this vacuum of water, you may actually hold a degree of consciousness to witness the pressure crushing your ribcage. Other than that, death would be near instant and excruciatingly painful. And after all that, you rest your bones in the ocean, as any last of your tender meat is eaten by the scavengers that dwell there. In the game though, you walk in a straight line, noticing the aquatic fauna is full of kawaii plants. Exiting a strange door at the bottom of the world's deepest trench, we proceed through. Now possessing all children of the earth, we are welcome to its center. Progressing forward, we see a large moving ball with a heavenly pillar. The fetuses almost beckon us to partake in whatever ritual unfolds before us. We analyze the strange material only to find that it is the meat of the world. Out of the meat comes a child, a strange clay-like creature that speaks telepathically through our touch. The creature wishes to awaken the children as it is time. No secrets will be kept in their domain. Growing wings, we take off in a very end of Evangelion way. Thus ends the base game. There are secret transient locations as well that will randomly appear, one green, purple, and yellow. For these locations, I will be analyzing them in depth as they are pretty short. First, starting off with green transient location, Thrait Village, it is just that. A little camp full of the Thrait people and how awful their lives have become. Most of the time when you see them out in the wild, they are simply scavenging for food and purpose seemingly. There are about four Thraits here, including a child Thraite. I believe the Thraite to be the original habitants of this world. The Thraite are misplaced people, and that is because of the government that has been established by people who do not live there originally. They are forced to hide and consume whatever they can find around them. In a constant state of survival, no one knowing of their struggle. This could also be commentary on the issue we have in our day and age. In our real life world, there are those who struggle without homes or struggle to stay afloat and are often looked over and forgotten. This also perhaps is representing the effects of colonization on a foreign population. As stated, they seem to be the original habitants, us being the invaders. Maybe there are more correlations to this fictional dystopian world to our own than we originally thought. Secondly, the purple transient location, starting point, there is a Thraite woman guarding a chrysalis that seems to have already hatched. The chrysalis contains a queen. The queen seems to have run off, and the Thraite woman fears that the world may change her to be rotten. I have a theory that we may be the queen, but I'll be building on that in a later segment. Just to be contrarian, let's disagree with this. Pompey is more of an observer. Though our actions affect the world, we have no correlation to the Thraite. As well as, whenever we try to interact with the Thraite, they seem to not like us or be uncomfortable with us representing what I believe to be the cycle of aging, maybe even speaking on the toxic relationships between parent and child, withholding experiences from your child due to bad experiences yourself. Due to this behavior, now the queen has escaped. The view of the Thraite woman, she believes the world is cruel, 
referring to those outside of this location as dogs. Looking more at what it is in terms of the game could simply be that their queen is out there and has abandoned them, the last hope of their people now missing. As sad as the state of the Thraid are, it seems like they will only continue to suffer or even cease to exist as a species. Finally is the strangest of all, the yellow transient location. Daddy's bad place, aka my room. <laughs> And let's just say you don't want to end up in daddy's bad place. <laughs> All jokes aside, um, I really didn't know what to make of this area. Having many theories of paternal abandonment to having a bad relationship with our character, Pompey's father, I actually ended up reaching out to the dev, which I do a lot in these deep dives, and they actually responded. The dev is a super cool person. It made me so happy. I asked him only what I needed as I would like to interpret the game from my perspective for the most part. Just getting into it, there is religious symbolism, a small home, and an almost nostalgic living room with a box TV that tells us a message. One of the tips given to us is that if a TV talks to you, it is a true friend. The dev asked me if I trust the TV. First, let's see what the TV said. Telling us to be advised of a large insect in the area that is very dangerous, we are warned to be extremely cautious. And yet, the bug isn't real at all. The ultimate contradiction. It is highly advised not to communicate with the bug either. I have another theory on this. Again, we'll be building in the end with the full analysis, but let's just play off of my first theory. This is meant to represent a mundane hell, how we live day-to-day -day life. The message on the TV, I believe, is to represent news or media that sometimes is stressful to hear. A tangible beast that is seemingly a threat, yet does not exist at all. Sometimes, it's easy to get wrapped up in the news. When the people reporting the news tell us we have no control over it, and just have to trust what the people in the colored box tell us. Sometimes, we don't know until we see it for ourselves. This follows the paranoid conspiracy theories that are littered throughout the game. It could also represent ideas instilled by families and how sometimes we can fear what is inside and outside our box. Wanting to escape, but being too afraid from what we've been taught to actually go through with it. Killing courage. The religious symbol, specifically the crucifix, applies that it is a household of rules and values of that respective religion. Perhaps a life like this is relatable, especially to Pompey. It is not one worth living in the mundane in her eyes. Obviously, she sees through this normal life now. A representation of being able to see and think beyond face value. Sometimes, a normal life is all people want, and that is okay. We all have different definitions of normality and success. Pompey, however, believes that this is some sort of brainwashing that has happened to those that inhabit this world. She seeks to liberate it. The dev of the game said this area does represent everything Pompey does not like. To quote directly, Daddy's bad place is a culmination of all of the places that she would not like to be. A bad smell, stuffy air, an uncomfortable symbol on the wall. All of it tears down to a burning horizon that it will continue on forever. A short snapshot of hell rooted in the ordinary. Do you trust what is on the TV? A last and final theory is that this world is coming to an end. Using the symbolism around us, how the box is shattered, it could symbolize a sort of rapture, the destruction of all we know around us, souls being taken, and some being left behind for an utter annihilation. A rewriting of life itself. A bug brings about this. Perhaps more religious symbolism to the locusts coming to start the end of days. Perhaps this is some sort of god. Lastly, to finish off the story is the epilogue. After beating the game, you hear this amazing song that is currently playing in the background right now. If you hit continue after beating the game, we are greeted with a new area entirely. Pompey, now having the meat of the earth and having access to infinite understanding, would like to claim it and complete their journey. 
Where is that? Nowhere else but the forbidden location. You enter a library full of books, a very calm feeling location set with an interstellar background. You walk up the stairs and down a hallway full of books until finding a single note. The note reads, Caldman 4, the brilliant interstellar phenomenon lighting up our skies. I don't feel that I need to introduce you to the Caldman 4. The interstellar phenomenon that has been making headlines for the last month. One only has to look to the skies to see the bizarre sight. Four brilliant lights, leading what looks like a trail of absolute darkness across the sky. The phenomenon has elicited all sorts of reactions. From wonder to outright panic, many religious leaders have pointed to the Kalman 4 as a sign for jubilation, or of end times to come, but what are they really? The answer is, we don't really know. The Kaldman 4 were first discovered on January 16th, 2021 by Harris Kaldman, a worker at the Green Bank Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia. At the time, they were characterized as a set of several superheated interstellar objects, moving through space at speeds previously unheard of. What of the dark space behind them? Though it might look as if the stars have simply disappeared, leading scientists assure that the stars are still most likely there, but that their light has been absorbed and hidden from us by way of a phenomenon known as heath nidale absorption. Light is absorbed into the trail of the Kaldman 4 and expelled out at the sides, known as the photon edge. All of these big scientific words led me to believe that this might be based on a real thing, Upon research, this article was not real. It is crazy how a few big words in an article, even if in a game, it is very convincing and it seems real. Maybe I am just like gullible, but I'm glad that I do like research and shit on this stuff because I literally thought like, oh, this is real. <laughs> this might actually be based on a real thing. No, you can't trick me. You can't, you can't, you can't trick good old backpack, you know? This phenomenon has been around for months, according to the game. Religious people feel it to be a message of triumph. Others are panicked at the uh, the sign of the end. The Heath Nydale absorption phenomenon again is only real in the game's canon. This is blocking out stars in the sky and seems to baffle those studying it. We leave the article to be greeted by four eyes. Exiting the library with this forbidden knowledge, we find the exit. We seemingly abandon our physical form in a boom so strong it breaks the monitor we see the world through. A connection lost screen is seen. We are then shown that we are connecting to a new subject. They are staying in a motel in the desert on another planet. We can see Pompey's planet in the distance there. Upon talking to the dog, he informs us that our face is abstract and broken. The dog introduces themselves as the king of all dogs. He warns us of the bloody earth right above us, that something has awoken and it will bring about destruction. This new character that we're playing as, I'm just gonna name him Boxman has the power to put an end to this. Apparently, there will be a team to assist us in this new adventure to save the world. And so, the game ends. This time for reals, because I try to see if there are extras. <laughs> With seemingly infinite secrets, leading to replayability, a strange and somehow relatable character, killer soundtrack, ambiance, and an environment that changes the more you play, study it, this game fucking rules. Before we get into the meaty symbolism that the game tries to portray and what exactly the story even means, let's discuss the face value of the game, that being the gameplay, music, environment, etc. The game plays with tank-like controls that mimic a Doom-styled game. Though combat can seem pretty intense at first, it becomes fairly simple to evade enemies with your iconic hammer. I really like the mechanics of looking around, talking and touching. It reminds me a little bit of Undertale, uh, though I never really played that game myself. The dialogue goes from whimsical to funny to existential to some of the wildest things you've ever heard. Some of the one-liners were really insane, especially in the hospital. Some of these facts, these real life facts are wild. There's one in particular that kind of like messed me up and then I did research and it was real. Um, let's just say I really enjoy philosophy and I learned something really messed up about Plato from this game. No, I don't want to talk about it. The graphics have many different styles, and I think that's what I really enjoy about the game. From an anime visual to a raw personal art style, to also a very grimy, abandoned feeling 3D environment. I feel like a lot of the different areas have their own style. The story needs these different styles to convey itself. 
It also separated the main character in the world, her being the only character in her art style. Visually, the game tells a story of its own, a world that has been run dry, a dying world, yet it's okay with that. I really also love how the visuals make you feel like you're going crazy too. You know upon first glance that our main character is not all there. The world that surrounds us is filled with an illegal, guilty feeling. The person who made windows and locks sure looks stupid with the invention of the hammer. This game is so quotable, I swear. I felt like I was urbexing while exploring every new area. The environment is so well done with the music, sound design, the helmet paired with the tank controls makes it seem like you're in a mech. Again, I gotta say, the music is stellar. From shifting the environment's moods to an even more depressing and traumatizing feeling to the very special end credits song that is a complete banger. The monster design as well, I, I, it, it's just amazing. It's an amazing take on horror. I don't necessarily think that any of these designs by themselves are particularly like horrifying, but it makes you uncomfortable. It seems to be a reflection of the mind of the person wearing the helmet. Do you watch anime? The grotesque discomfort also peers into how simple things beauty can be taken away so easily. The face of our favorite characters being put on chunks of pulsating meat, veins, just, just a very strange world. Things almost look familiar, but are light years away from what we thought they were. Looking into the real life tips scattered throughout the game, I simply could not find anything on them, or maybe they just like don't exist at all. This definitely means that the dev likes to look through conspiracy theories, and I mean who doesn't like a fun little, a little life theory every now and again. It is such a cool thing to see someone create a character based on someone whose life has been consumed in conspiracy. At first I questioned if the main character was a narcissist, with how she was kind of portrayed in the first cutscene. Always wondering what people are thinking, needing to know what these people are thinking, but I think they're more psychotic, more anxious than a narcissist, because they don't really care about how they are portraying themselves, they just want to, they are just anxious about what is being hidden from them. Controlled by this, we are driven to find the answers. A point against both being uh, anxious or narcissistic is that uh, the, the game just shows her to be psychotic. Breaking and entering, seeing things that may or may not be there, killing entities around her with no remorse. Some of the theories in the real life like tips section are paranoid nonsense, like the virus is not existing, it's just your body pushing you for what you did wrong. Again, I couldn't find much on any of the conspiracies. I did a lot of digging too, uh, like the one about the orifice that we used to have before the Crusades. <laughs> it was like an orifice on our head. It's it's so weird, man. The dragonfly one as well, uh, which to me sounds more like a riddle or a puzzle than a uh, than a conspiracy theory. But the best thing about all of this is now my search history is all dogged up, so. That's great. Speaking of dogs, actually, the king of all dogs is a psychopomp, legitimately being the guide for our character and for Boxman, the character that we play later on in the game. The dog's art style and the way its head is split in the middle kind of reminds me of the art style from uh, Lost in Vivo. The king of all dogs could be a Portuguese Padango. Upon further research, the symbolism of the breed is loyalty and freedom. Loyal, perhaps, to those chosen to be psychopomps as he is there to guide them. Freedom, which seems to be the goal of the game, the liberation of secrets. Again, not much is known about our secondary character, Boxman, other than that he is a man of business. Now, moving on to the big reveal, the, the, the final secret, really, uncovering the story, which is more massive than I thought. Expansive details and seemingly infinite secrets scattered throughout the game. There is so much in this game. Seemingly, I really don't know for myself. Until somebody really plays through and finds absolutely everything, or simply looks through the files, this game could be infinite for all I know. What I will do is put together a possible outcome. What I think the story means, and I'll build on this as much as I can. The story of this paranoid Pompey is not one of the chosen one. She doesn't even fit the hero archetype at all. More of an anti-hero if we were to classify her, but leans more to villainous, I suppose, depending on your playstyle. Her job is to escort the souls that have overstayed their welcome. Perhaps liberating souls is not her only task, as providing truth seems to be the main objective. Who is Pompey really? 
She herself has become a psychopomp, going off the main definition. The tipping point of this theory is at the children's hospital level. We have to kill many creatures in this area compared to others. Our goal is to reap the souls of those who have been alive longer than they should have. Come to think of it, all levels end in death only to grab the egg of the earth, which essentially is a fetus representing birth. The reaper of souls, that we know as death, is a psychopomp. This could mean that Pompey's task could be to put souls where they belong. The cycle of life and death as psychopomps are accustomed to, as they are guides that lead our souls over many, many lifetimes. Unknowingly, the helmet that she created was a gateway to reach her higher purpose. Not just to learn everything, but to take back the souls that have overstayed their welcome. I had a theory as well that we are just hallucinating all of this. Not feeding into the delusion, I think it's safe to say that she's having a nervous breakdown. What is seen in her world is all in her head. Having a sort of final breakdown, enacting horrible mutilations to officials by brutalizing them, warping their flesh and bones with a hammer, sheets of flesh hanging off parts of the hammer, stained in a reflective crimson sheet. Perhaps Pompey ascending into the Aether, her becoming the goddess, is her actually dying. Being shot and killed by those defending themselves or even by authorities. Makes sense. The library of knowledge being the recollection of memories before her final steps into whatever heaven or hell await her. Instead of being greeted by the warm embrace of the ancestors, she is welcomed by four eyes that stare angrily at you. When exiting the library, you can't help but feel some sort of guilt. The people I killed, the things I did with my life, was it all worth it? I believe the ending as we explode and become nothing is us finally fading away. Our breath ceasing, eyes rolling back, the cold, like a hand with a blanket, covering our body. According to some posts on Twitter, this theory is false completely. <laughs> what happens in the game is the actual world, not a delusion. Moving on, reality has become a shell of what it once was. The hospital, for example, using the poor as fuel to ensure the rich live forever. We talked about Pompey being a psychopomp of death. Perhaps she's more one of justice. Building on this, justice is defined by what is just, seen to achieve the highest good in harmony. All the characters in the game, excluding the King of Dogs, are killable. You are able to take whatever souls you wish. Perhaps we're not as just as we thought. Maybe we are the destruction of the world. But is that such a bad thing? Society seems to profit off the unwell and the unwealthy as it helps to keep those in power alive and well forever. There is also another earth that can be seen from the children's hospital area of an earth bleeding. This could perhaps be a reflection of the world we reside in being in shambles. It also seems like those who inhabit the world are aware, as stated by Pompey, but no one seems to take any action. Everyone, especially the workers, loves their jobs and wants to keep things as normal as possible like a hive mind, just following orders. Reminds me of another game we played. People are also okay with children who do not wish to learn what the government allows them to turn them into literal kitchen appliances. There are also bugs and ticks put into children to monitor them. Going to the end of the game, Boxman is on a different world. And it is very hard to tell if Pompey is the threat that the King of Dogs is referring to or not. It's hard to discern because there's evidence both ways. It looks like there being two Earths is also something that is a conspiracy hidden in plain sight. As we have it confirmed and the whole library of knowledge shows us that this is what they have been hiding in plain sight this whole time. This is also confirmed with a note we found in the sewage plant as well, that people know about the other Earth but deny its existence. So this becomes the true conspiracy. There are two Earths, a mystery hidden in plain sight, never questioned. It is kind of funny to see that Pompey thought so many people were hiding things from her when seemingly everything was just written out in plain sight. The world is a shithole that only cares for profit. Those who serve no purpose will disintegrate and be stripped of its nutrients to feed to those deemed worthy by a society that cares not for its inhabitants. Pompey always thought that everyone had special powers, but that is also not true at all. The rulers of the world have suppressed these powers, but they could not stop Pompey from enacting her justice, true justice, through acts of hyperviolence, tearing at the tissue fiercely to reveal bloody white bones. 
the flesh's secret, an entity of true knowledge, dragging both innocent and evil souls harshly through the rough rocks and into the eternal fire of damnation. Making a connection to Evangelion, perhaps she is some sort of mother, or queen that's duty is to reset the world. Following this theory, this may make more sense now, that daddy's bad place, the insect on the television, can read minds. It might be us. Now, I know we're not a bug, but it is shown that we attain so much power that we lose our physical form. When we interact with the meat of the earth in the final scene and telepathically know its thoughts, we may gain the power the helmet could not give us. The ability to read minds, change form, Pompey becomes a god. What kind of god? That is, that is unknown. From what we know about our nervous, manic character, it would be a mad one. The woman who never had any sanity, who spent the whole game smiling devilishly, now has attained the power of God. A connection as well. In the children's hospital level, next to a false wall that leads you to the tick the doctors created, is an extremely important note. I really love how in the game there is a lot of really important context that just reads as senseless ramblings until making some deeper connections with the story. Hence the replayability. The note contains two symbols being right side up crosses with circles at the bottom, one of the circles having horns seemingly. The crosses with just a circle at the bottom if turned upside down is the symbol for female, also the symbol for Venus. As stated by a Thraight woman in transient location green, the village, the queen had escaped. This pushes a further connection to Pompey being born from the chrysalis, being the queen, meaning she is the queen of Venus, perhaps even the goddess Venus. Another weird thing, the, the planets are also said to be fictitious in the writing. The devs said that both Pompey and Boxman's names are unknown, but they are known by many. I didn't quite understand what he meant by this initially, but now it makes more sense than ever actually confirming that these two are gods represented by Venus and Mercury. Going from the Roman meanings of the planet, there is the god of commerce, Mercury. Also tying into the dev's hint of him being a businessman, the god of commerce, and a god of victory, Venus. Fun fact as well, the Romans actually used Venus to symbolize their imperial power. Also found in green transient location, Thrait Village, there is actually wall art of a prophecy that has both the symbols of Venus and Mars in it. This wall art again proving the importance of the symbols, the importance of Pompey's role with the threat, tying it all together that she is indeed Venus. A goddess, perhaps? A queen. Most definitely someone who is bringing an end to this world. This is all I could make of what I've researched and seen in the game as a coherent story. Now, exploring some final fun facts, I did ask the dev about inspiration behind the game, and he answered this. Overall, I would say that FLCL, another Gainax work, has had a far larger impact on me over the years. As for Psychopomp, the initial tone of the game was inspired by the works of Nekojiro and the music of the band My Dead Girlfriend, specifically their songs Spirits of the Dead's Bad Dream and Cattle Mutilation, Strange UFO. The style of the main character is very similar to the style in FLCL. Gainax work, for those who don't know, is the studio behind Evangelion, FLCL, Gurren Lagann, and many, many more. They made many influential animes during the 90s and 2000s. The studio may not be around anymore, but their influence on anime and the minds of others still is very much alive. Nekojiro, for those of you who don't know, is an artist. Real name, Shiyomi Hashigushi. Their drawings are mostly of cats, and their works are inspired by their dreams. The cute little cats go on adventures, and sometimes the themes can be very, again, dream emulator, LSD, psychedelic-esque. <laughs> music of the game being inspired by a band I have never heard of before had some really neat music. I can see how the tone can match the game and the lyrics perfectly. Reading the lyrics from my favorite song of the band, Cattle Mutilation, translated from Japanese, if that light floating in the sky would be a UFO, then the me from tomorrow will be completely erased. And if by chance you would coldly laugh, as if you were trembling, I couldn't possibly do anything. The piled up voices resonate dimly, 
as I recall the days of that girl. As if her lies were laughing along with her, I should just accept them. But why? Honestly, the song kind of sums up Pompey as a character. Hell, even the world she inhabits perfectly. Maybe it even kind of describes our world. A world that is encompassed by depression, joy, death, beauty, glory, hate, love. Maybe being too poetic <laughs> with the connection. Let's get back to the game. The game carries a lot of these and art imitates life. The character Pompey relates to the player like a mirror. We have all wanted to know something at one point or another. We have all felt bigger than we are, smaller than we are. Like the world is gonna end with that last decision we made. But we keep going. Maybe, even though the game shows paranoia, maybe it shows us growth. It shows us courage. We had an issue that seemingly plagued us our whole lives, but we took up responsibility to face the unknown, walk through these strange worlds and were seemingly unharmed depending on your playstyle, I guess. Personally, I would like to take this out of the game. To have the courage to stand up for what I believe in. The courage to face things that I fear. To see life's beauty rather than its flaws. To continue to live and lead a better life. I think this game made me crazy, bro. So what did we learn? I'm genuinely asking, what did we learn here? Honestly, I learned that good stories know no bounds. After now having a few deep dives under my belt, I actually really love going the extra mile to make these connections and put things together. This video was extremely challenging to make. And just being honest, when trying to come up with the meaning of the story, I, I almost gave up. I'm really glad I didn't. This game is worth playing, worth talking about. I always say this on games I really enjoy, but it is a piece of interactive art. Not only do I love deep games like this that make you think extra hard about what you just did, games with heavy symbolism, I love passion. Passion that shows in these indie games. This game exemplifies that. I think something else I learned on this journey, playing the game and making the video, is that passion prevails when you do something you love. To my community of backpackers, never give up on what you really love to do. To all the people passing by on this wide, wide web, I hope something stuck with you on this video, or you tried the game out for yourself. Maybe even analyzing more in depth your favorite games as art. Oh yeah, and please subscribe. Even though research led me to many answers that may or may not be true, art is to be interpreted. So I'd like to leave the conversation open. What did you guys think of the game? What messages did you take away from it? How did the game make you feel? I'd love to hear all about it down in the comment section below. And while you're at it, don't forget to leave the video a big smackaroo, a big like, as it does help show support for the channel. And while you're at it, hit the big red button, the subscribe, pick up a backpack, and become a backpacker today. And with that, my name is Backpack Comics, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye, have a nice night.